Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com and to my second tutorial on Raspberry Pi Robotics. And whereas last time I showed you how to program LEDs, this time I'll explain how to control electric motors. In preparation for this build I bought this exciting box of parts from a Pimo Ronnie who are the UK supplier of Polaloo Robotics. So I suggest if you're in the UK you might want to buy things from Pimo Ronnie or in Europe. If you're in the US you might want to go directly to uh, Polaloo. As you can see we've got some lovely sound effects materials. We've got uh, obviously the paperwork. The first two exciting things in here look are, um, are these. What are these Chris? I hear you cry. Are they earrings? No, these are micro metal gear motors. Amazing little motors there as you can see. They've got them um, gearboxes on the front. You can buy these and um, with all sorts of different gearing ratios. Here I've gone for 286 to 1 which means our robot will be a uh, quite slow moving hopefully which will give us more control. Also in the box we've got this. What's this I hear you cry? This actually is our Zumo chassis from Polaloo. Um, this is where our motors will go and it'll build up into a little tracked vehicle. We'll build that in a minute. Finally in here I bought myself some proper jumper leads. Last time I scavenged some jumper leads from a, a computer audio cable and so you can see we've got here some proper um, uh, these are what female to female jumpers and here's some uh, male to female jumpers. These are on one lead as you can see but if you want to you can quite easily just take these and uh, peel one off and there you've got a, a nice separated out uh, male to female jumper. Also in this build we're going to need one of these. This is an L298N H bridge motor controller. I'll tell you exactly what this does in a second, but for now I'll just point out the key thing is don't pay too much for one of these. You can buy an L298N for about $3 in the States, £2 in the UK, but you can easily pay five times that or indeed more. So shop around on Amazon or eBay to get the best value on your motor controller. Also in the build, of course, we'll be using our Raspberry Pi. We'll also need some batteries here and a battery caddy for reasons I'll explain later and I'm going to use some long pieces of wire again for reasons which will become clear. Right, it's now time to start putting things together. So I've laid out all the parts of the Zumo chassis. We've got them here. Uh, we'll start out with the, uh, the main unit. We'll take off the battery cover, flip it over. There we are, like, like that. And we can now drop in a bolt in there. You'll discover uh, there are some instructions on, on the Pulu site, no instructions with it, but this is fairly simple. You put a bolt through there, you put a um, screw in there, and then you basically tighten that up. Um, you're supposed to use an Allen key, which will probably make this a little bit easier, but that's now gone perfectly well. Hand tight is perfectly sufficient as well for this, you don't want to do any damage. It's a nice little floating wheel. Same, of course on the other side, making sure I use the right wheels. There we are, one of those, and the washer. Who's forgotten to put the bolt in first? Not me, of course, that was a complete tip what I intended to do. That will just screw in there, it's just starting to make contact. Oh, there we are, and again, I've got two wheels. Oh, it's getting exciting already. Um, Next thing to do is going to fit the motors um, into um, this end of the unit. But before we put the motors in, what I'm going to do is to take each motor and a couple of uh, cut off jumper wires. I've cut two of my um, female to female jumpers in two. I'm going to take these and attach these to the back of the motor. As you can see, I've currently just twisted them through. You could leave them like that if you really wanted to, but it would be better, of course, to go in with your soldering iron and just there we are, drop a bit of solder in. First time I've soldered on camera, but it does seem to have worked. We need of course to do the other motor, and then I'll just drop in to the assembly. Little micro motors, just drop in there into slots, one over there, and one over there. Get in, there we are, got two motors in, little robot now. Uh, we now need to put on the top plate, which I'll do by the magic of filmmaking and 
there we are we've now got the thing um, all secured in by some screws with some bolts on the side those were rather tricky to get in a lot of turning thing up and down to do that uh, but now of course we should be able to put on the wheels these push on but you've got to get them in the right orientation because the these are cam shaft there's one that was that was very easy another one will go in here hopefully that'll be wheel two or wheel four depending on your point of view go on it's a push fit wheel why won't it go in there we are they've got to go quite a long way in because of course I've got to line up with the tracks and in theory if I've got this right I can now take a caterpillar track and apply it on that side take a caterpillar track and apply it on this side and we have a nice little um tractored vehicle getting getting rather exciting right i think it's time we turned our attention back from uh, mechanics to electronics and computing so here we have our raspberry pi which we're going to connect up to the l 298N motor controller. The L298N is a clever little device. Technically, it's this one component here, which is actually labeled L298N. This is the actual H-bridge um, piece of silicon. But many people sell the board and call the whole board the L298N. Um, and that means you'll find on different boards the location of the four sets of pins may be slightly different, but they'll work in exactly the same way. The first set of pins we need to worry about are the power pins, which are these three pins here. And if you wonder how you know which one is which, on the bottom side of the board you can see they are labelled. We've got a ground connection there which needs to connect to the ground connection on the Pi, and also to a negative connection which will power our motors, the batteries in other words. And you'll see it's labelled plus 12 volts there. That can be any voltage up to 12 volts, and we'll be connecting that in this case to a 6 volt battery pack. So I'm going to connect those connections in. And there we are, we now have our power connectors in place. You can see the batteries are going to be powered by this little clip, which will go onto a battery pack. And the wire to the Pi is onto pin 6, which is a negative wire on the Pi. I've just tucked the wires out of the way and try and keep this neat as we go. Next connectors I'm going to connect are the motor connectors, which connections here and here. Last time you saw our Zumo, it had just been finished with some flying leads out the back for the motors. I've now attached it to an umbilical cord because we're going to run it remotely from the Pi. I'm not going to mount a Pi on the device yet. So we've got these flying leads from the two motors on the end of a long wire. And we're going to connect these to the board a bit like this. There we are. We've now got our, our motors connected on the motor cables. And the last thing we need to do is to actually activate the pins that are going to turn the motor on and off. If we look at a close-up here, you see there's four pins, and basically the first two control the first motor and the second two control the second motor. So if there's a signal from the Pi on the first pin, it'll turn the first motor in one direction, on the second pin it'll turn it in the other direction, and so on for the other motor. So what we'll do, we'll take a jumper lead and we'll connect it from Pi pins 7, 11, 13, and 15. And with this jumper in place, we've now got the whole thing wired up. I would note you do need to have on this board jumpers set to enable the two motors. Normally a board like this will come with the jumpers already there. We can see them here and here. Um, if those jumpers aren't there, you're going to have to put something on yourself. Maybe um, uh, you can use a jumper lead if you haven't got those jumpers. To make exactly clear how everything's connected, here's a wiring diagram. You can always, of course, pause the video to take a look at this in more depth. But with the addition of a battery pack, we should now have finished the construction of our Raspberry Pi programmable robot. Right, it's now time to uh, test everything out. I've uh, got the robot here connected to the Pi by its umbilical cord with the battery pack installed. And we've got here on the screen, you can see we're running the idle environment run by uh, typing sudo idle to get into the root mode for this as I showed you in the last video. I'm going to show you a few bits of code which will hopefully put the robot through its paces. In the first test here, I've set up two things. I've imported the library for GPIO and time, as I did in the last video. And I set the board numbering on the Pi to board. And I've actually set up the GPIO output pins 7, 11, 13 and 15 to be outputs. I explained that in more depth in the last video. Then what I'm going to do here is a very straightforward test, which is to basically turn on each of the four pins I'm using in turn for one second. So turn on pin 7, wait a second, turn it off, then pin 11, then pin 13, 
than pin 15. If you remember effectively, the pins are tied to the four corners of the robot in terms of moving it in those directions, as this diagram shows. But let's actually go back to the shot of the robot, run the code, see what happens. And there we are. The robot, as you can see, is very much alive. That was a very good test, wasn't it? Proves the whole principle of controlling the robot by the GPI of pins. Do something slightly more complicated. Here we've got another piece of code, same setup on the front. But here I'm going to turn on two motors together. So I'm going to turn on pins 7 and 13 to drive us forward, wait for two seconds, turn those pins off, wait for a second, and then turn on pins 11 and 15 to bring us back again for more two seconds, and then again turn the things off and clean up the output. So we'll run that code, see what that does. Should drive the robot forward for two seconds, and back for two seconds. Forward. Back, it seems to be working. Can we do things more complex than that? Well, of course we can. Um, what if we go to a test here? where I'm going to try and draw a square. So again, same input, but now we're going to run a loop, which will run for four mm. stages. And here we're going to drive the robot forward for two seconds, and I just did, and then turn pins off. We're going to wait for 0.2 seconds on the corner just to give it a little break. I don't want to tie the thing out. We're then going to turn the robot by applying power to pins 7 and 15, so the traps go in opposite directions to spin it on its axis. And my guess is about 0.97 seconds is about right. Turn that off and then finish up. That will run four times to hopefully draw a square. This is a trickier test. See how it does. I'm going to help out the robot, making sure its wire doesn't get caught here. But one side of square, two side of square, three side of square, four side of square, and it turns itself back where it started. It's not actually bad, it slipped a little bit. You can't expect the motors in something like this to be perfect in terms of how the thing will run, but it shows you very much the principles. Final example I've got is taking that even further. Here's an example with, again, I've loaded in the basic libraries and set GPI pins up. I'm then asking for some user input. I'm asking the user to tell us how many sides they want uh, and how big they want the shape we're doing to be. I then defined a variable called full turn, which is the time it takes to spin the robot 360 degrees, which is going to be our 0.97 times 4, 0.97 was for 90 degrees. We're then going to run a loop, which is just like we did last time, but it's based on the variables. So it's going to run for the number of times in sides. So if it's a square, it'll run four times. It'll then take the robot forward, and then it'll keep doing that for the variable size which is what we input here, how big do we want um, our square or shape to be. Turn the pins off, wait on the corner. It'll then do its turn, and the turn here will be based on the time, which is the full turn divided by the number of sides. So it will be divided by four if it's going to be a square. So, uh, and then on the end, I'm going to clean things up. So if I run that piece of code, it'll ask for our variables. I'm going to say how many sides? Four. How big? We'll do a slightly smaller square, exactly, I don't know, 1.75. Pick a random number. Forward. Two sides. Three sides. Four sides. Turn back again. Again, it slipped a little bit. I'll just stick it back, hopefully, in view for you. And just to prove this code will do other shapes, we'll run it, um, run module, and we'll put some different variables in. What if we did, say, a triangle? So if we give it three sides, and we ask it to do, I don't know, a 1.5 size. One side spins for more. Two sides spins for more. Three sides and come back roughly where it started. So, um, not the most accurate robot in the world, but you wouldn't expect it for what we spent on the resources here. But hopefully we proved in this video and, and the previous one 
how you can write a bit of Python code on a Raspberry Pi to turn on and off the GPIO pins, and from that to turn on either LEDs or motors, and that's all the basis of robotics. Hopefully, this video has demonstrated the potential of the Raspberry Pi as a robotics controller. It would, of course, be great to actually fix the Pi itself on top of my robot, uh, to control it perhaps by Wi-Fi, and even to add a camera. And these are all things I might actually try in the future. But now that's it for another video, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.